Dad. Yeah? Will you read me a story? Of course. Do you promise you remember the monsters? Promise. <laughs> Let's have a party, everybody. This is extraordinary. <laughs> You're too negative. All these years bringing darkness into my life. I can hear my inner voice now. But you know what it's saying? <laughs> some patience. It hasn't finished yet. Hello and welcome to this BFI at Home Q&A for Under Gods. My name is Amon Woman and I'm a contributing editor for Empire Magazine and today I'm joined by writer-director Chino Moya and actors Kate Dickey, Ned Dennehy and Adrian Rawlins. Welcome to you all. Thank you hello. Very much. <laughs> Hi, hello. Chino, I want to start with you. Uh, what was the genesis of this movie? Well, it was never a deliberate plan. It's, it's a movie that, well enough, uh, just, it's, it didn't, it was not like an idea that I have for like something that I've been mulling over for a long time. It, it was more like the urge of, of, of making a film after like previous failed attempts that uh, that forced me to write this thing. And, and I think because of that, because it, it was not a preconceived plan, weirdly enough, it became probably the most personal thing that I've ever written because it came straight out of my brain instead of, of my maybe my subconscious brain. It was more like a, a bit of a, a stream of consciousness type of process rather than than a rational one. So, and then once I wrote it, I realized a lot of things of, of uh, even about myself, but uh, about what the movie was about and stuff. So it was, yeah, it was definitely not a preconceived idea. So, yeah, I mean, you, you said it's still you know, it's a very personal movie. I assume that's sort of alluding to, you know, you, you, put, you put a lot of uh, your thoughts on the state of the world in this movie uh, about authoritarianism and all the rest of it. Are you able to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, and I guess it, it, I think the movie in a way, there was something about it was a form of psychoanalysis or therapy for me, I guess, especially when you make a movie, you need to make sense out of it with words because you need to pitch it to people, uh, to a lot of people and you need to try to make as much sense as you can. And through that, I, I've, there were a lot of things in the movie that are things that I've been I mean, always interested in, like the totalitarian societies, like the failed capitalism, like this idea of in general failed utopias. And I, I never really knew why I was into those things. I just knew I was into those things and, and a lot of my work gravitated around those, those ideas. But because I have to put it, I have to pitch it to people I have to try to realize why. And then I realized that basically probably one of the main reasons is because I was born in Spain after 40 years of, of a dictatorship. Literally, I was born less than two months after Franco, our dictator, died. So I was in my mom's belly under a totalitarian society. 
And then I was born in a moment before democracy arrived. So it was, I was born in this sort of in between time. And then democracy arrived and it was the 80s and it was this neoliberal free market kind of dream of this capitalist thing. A lot of money came to Spain and there was these dreams that everything was going to be great and everyone was going to be rich and progress just arrived to, to this country, which was fairly behind when I was a, a child. And then those dreams of capitalist dreams that sort of fell apart in some way. So I guess, the, and I realized that maybe it's, it's having born in between this totalitarian society and this, this capitalist sort of failed utopia is what, what made me gravitate around those, those two worlds. And um, that's very obviously quite, quite present in, in under, un, um, under God. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ned, I really loved your performance in this one uh, as Harry. He says that he's here to help, but there's something off about him. It's a little bit shifty. Uh, when it came time to sort of play that character, what sort of conversations were you having with Chino in building Harry? Well, first of all, when I read the script, there's about five parts that, you know, I, I would have loved to, you know, be one of the guys collecting the bodies. I mean, either one, and you know, every part. So, um, Harry it comes in at the beginning and we, at the beginning of the story, we don't really know. We see the outside world here and we, we don't really know, is, it, is he a ghost or a robot or it's like some other being or is he human? Or So he, he's kind of just friendly, but a little bit shifty. And I mean, I, the, I love the lack of narrative in, and, and the, the, let's say unsettling kind of elements of the of the movie where it doesn't set out and and it's great to work with somebody like, like Chino who's not setting out to entertain we're not in it's not in, we're not in the we're in the entertainment business we're not in the entertainment business in Chino's movie because it it's it, it um serves up a little bit of you know discomfort or you know unpleasant uh, uh, you know, it's meditative. It's it's not going to fulfil. A lot of people just won't like that grim, gritty world. And what 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 you know? What's the story about? But I'm one of the people that loves that kind of um, weird dystopia stuff. <laughs> so I don't know what the question was. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> it was. When 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 you're building Harry with you know what sort of conversations are you having about sort oh, of his motivations yeah. and everything else? I I think we're trying to imbue a little bit of what Katie has later, which is this amazing you, you know this kind of pseudo psycho babble that you know that Katie comes to later with the, the the Mercury package you know for her guy, which is fantastic, <laughs> and she's heard her inner voice. Now, I, I also wanted Harry to have an element of that psychobabble in that, you know, particularly in that, the, the, the you know, the, the, the three things, you know, be nice, be nice, be nice, so mm -hmm. that he's got this new world. Um, what's the word for that? New world, psychobabble, pseudo psychotherapy, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So, <laughs> you know, um, so there's an element of that which makes him the good guy and it makes... Um, uh, Michael's character, the, the 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 bad guy. So, and then so we're trying to conversations with Chino are, are just how shifty maybe to make him, and maybe it's not too giveaway that maybe he's a nice guy just locked out. So, but there's something not quite right. Yeah, straight away, I think. Yeah, it's a bit of a mistake to let him in. You know, my it's a, it's, <laughs> it's not it wasn't a good idea. Let him in. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he drank all his booze and shagged his wife and then left. And, right? Who yeah, does that? Who man. does that? I know. Honestly. I know. <laughs> okay, and Adrian, I'm going to get, I'm going to ask you about your characters in a second, but I want to, uh, oh. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, sort of follow up from something Ned said there in terms of there's like many different characters and Ned says he wants to, so that he, he would love to have it, had a shot at many of them. If you could play another character that's not your own in this story. What character would that be? Oh, let me think then. The skater. 
Okay. The skater. <laughs> See, I would quite like to play Adrian's part, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well. I, I, I'd quite like to play some, I think, but I just haven't got the body <laughs> for it. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, because he just doesn't... He, he only has one line to learn. I mean, it's a dream job. It's a dream job, just turn up. But and, yeah, and no, Adrian, but, but, Adrian, Adrian had to learn a whole song. Like, yeah, exactly. No, oh, I mean, I have, so say, I have to say, I have to say, when I saw that moment, it's just like cinematic, absolute joy. It's like Fra oh, Frank Sinatra would turn in his grave, and Sid, <laughs> Sid Vicious would applaud. It was just the most cringy squeal oh. inside moment oh it's so yeah. painful yeah i i just i that just blew me away that that's in that whole it oh, blew that. me away too it's one of my favorite scenes in the oh, movie yeah, yeah and, me too and it makes me cry as well and do you know what i look for me like for me sorry i'm leaping in with my, my <laughs> go ahead. But for me, like what happens in Undergods is all the layers of morality and that veneer of kind of civility is gone. And it's everyone out for themselves almost in a way. And you don't even have the that veneer of kind of pretending <laughs> that you're going to do something for someone else, you know. And that's what really interested me about the script, like how far what would it look like society if we really push the you know there is no such thing as you know looking after your neighbor or a kind of socialist thing and um that's what I find utterly fascinating about under gods is these characters a lot of them are unlikable as well a lot of the time Adrian for me is like character that I really feel has got kind of more remnants of the old world of morality and civility and a bit of kindness. You do buy me a bloody electric kettle for a digital kettle for my, <laughs> my birthday, which is terrible. But you've got this sort of kindness in your character that I just feel the other characters are so about their happiness and what they want and what they want in life that, yeah, I find that fascinating about the script but there's this idea that people are sort of sleepwalk walking through this world you yes. know half, dream oh. and half, half awake and asleep and and adrian's character is kind of in this situation with burn gorman which is just a, that's just oh, it's awful. It's just like the corporate slime is just oh amazing. he's amazing isn't he yeah. burn he's amazing yeah we really feel for Adrian's character and, and as you said yeah. him having some semblance of old world decency um, yeah. yeah strangely enough and that's that's the beauty of also working with actors Adrian's character Dominic for me on the page he was the person I hated the most yeah. as, a, for, as a human being and yeah. in the film, actually, as 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 Katie says, you're probably the one of the person that I, people who I empathize the most with, weirdly enough. And it, on the page, I was like, I hated the, that person. I thought he was. Me too. Person. Me too. When I read the script, I said, like, Oh yeah. my god, this husband, you know. But you brought this beautiful, oh beautiful. I don't even know the words, but you know what I mean? This beautiful whole kind of fragility and kind of vulnerability to it, didn't you? Yeah. Didn't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. Adrian, I want to ask you about the, the My Way sequence, uh, which again, you know, we all love. Is, is that scene a day that you mark in your calendar and how many takes of that did you do? I can't remember. We did a few, didn't we, Chino? Yeah, but not many because there was some many. technical. We had a, a technical problem in this very crucial moment. I don't remember what happened, but we have a couple of technical problems, so we couldn't. We we just did, we were meant to do endless takes, and we couldn't. But somehow, like like Adrian and Byrne, they completely nailed it in just a couple of takes. Oh, so, beautiful! I think um, it's. 
I, I mean, in a sense, it's wonderful to have that moment because I, th I think Dominic, you know, he's just got swept along as everybody, I think, in the film did into this sort of dystopian, cold, heartless world. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and he's, you know, he's just a small man with no... Yeah no steel backbone really and 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 the only time that it comes out and it, it, it you know it, it's, it was such a gift to have that that my way moment if you like is is that it all comes out it's it's like 30 years yeah. pent up yeah. just, you know kowtowing you know just okay. just taking it and taking it and it comes out and really has no effect whatsoever, uh, apart from, you know, he, he sort of vomits some some something he should have vomited donkeys years ago, yeah. uh, and, and it goes for nothing. <laughs> he just gets thrown out. Oh, Don, <laughs> it's so awful. Oh, it's so it's so painful to watch that yeah, scene yeah. it's so painful like you literally no, want to climb out your skin you know mm. yeah. so adrian after you do a scene like that is my way now your go-to karaoke for all time <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has to be right <laughs> the funny thing is when he comes on the radio i can't remember the words <laughs> but i'm not sure i could at the on the day <laughs> Either. Oh. So it didn't really matter um but yeah it if it comes on it has a it has a it has a little a little a little free on in my <laughs> into my stomach <laughs> it, it's kind of a laugh out loud moment as well but it's like scream inside but like yeah it's, there's a few laugh out loud moments in the film i i, I think and yeah, that's definitely one of them, and 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 maybe Ty Murphy coming in as the Yoha <laughs> to meet father. That scene where he's, he's going, you know, what do you do for a living, and he's pissed, and it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And yeah. uh, oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant, Ty um, as well, whole, isn't he? Yeah. The whole setup with the, the with the princess daughter and the father is, again, it's just it's just juicy. Just it's it's. Just every look, every moment of this movie is 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 a thing of great beauty. But I, but I think that that's the strength of it in in a sense for me is is you know even if you don't hook into the characters, which are quite hard to hook into in terms of like caring. Yeah, you know, yeah. Their their humanity is so washed out. Yeah. You know the 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 film just just keeps layering onto you this this world, which you yeah. can feel. You, you know it gets under your skin, and it's not always a you know a, a pleasant experience. But yeah. it starts to throw. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, it does. And that score, I mean, the score for the movie is. Amazing. I was, yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask about that. It's it's, it's done by Wolczek Golzuski, uh, and you're right. It's so retro yet oh. futuristic, fully electronic. Um, Stop Chino, me. I know that you've worked with him before. What sort of conversations were you having with him about striking the right tone for this film? Mm. Um, yeah. Well, no. With with him, it's. Um, uh, I knew. Yeah, I was listening to a lot of like German electronic music from the late 70s, early 80s while writing, prepping the movie. And he always felt that it was, it was the soundtrack of, of Van de Gogh.
we finally were uh, shooting, started editing, etc. We started looking on, and I came across him. He feels that he's one of the, he has a bit of a cult following in this kind of synth, analog synth world. And he felt that he was like, he's, he's made some beautiful scores for all the, all the films. And so, so we got in touch and we never met. I still haven't seen Walt yet. Oh, well, wow. He, he lives in, I in Krakow and I offered at one point, like, hey, it was, so I just go and see you. And he was quite, quite private in, in and then we offered him to, to come to London. And he, he was a bit private in that sense. Really nice, super nice guy, very, open to changes to collaborating really and he had some kind of like a like whatever it takes to be a good musician he he has that and so he did this amazing amazing uh, score then also on on top of that we got a couple of other people we got a guy called jeremy wormsley who composed um, a couple of tracks which are really good we got we got another guy in Spain that also did some music called Gerardo Herrero. And we also got a few, we got in touch with a few of the musicians, the, those ele German electronic pioneers, electronic pioneers. And weirdly enough, I think where they were very happy that someone got in touch with them because it, it seems that people had sort of forgotten them. So it was not not very complicated to get the rights. And so, and we end up, it was a combination of, of Wojciech Skoll, who, who he did the main, main thing, but also small bits from other, other places. And that now, how did you get the rights to, from Conway Twitty for the best <laughs> song ever? <laughs> it's like, what, what, how does that work? But that's Ned's karaoke go-to, we know that now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it was and, also one of those, a, a person called Sarah Bridge who's the music supervisor, who did a lot of work. It's so, it's so, it's so randomly brilliant that it just comes in there. It's amazing. Also, there's something that I thought the other day that people never, no one, because I saw someone writing it on Twitter and it's true. Amongst all of that, there's a Girls Aloud uh, song in the movie. Girls Aloud! <laughs> I'm gonna have to watch this again and look out for it. It's not while I'm getting battered by a kettle, is it? <laughs> it's before, it's the party. It's when you go to the party, Adrian. That's the first, oh. first song that plays. Yeah. All, all, oh, I'm I love say, that. all I'm gonna say about that is, Chino, you have very good taste in music. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask about Rachel. She is a character who goes to many interesting places over the course of the movie. Um, one minute she's you know doing jet black humor, next minute she's giving you a very eerie smile, which stayed with me for a while. I just say, uh, so no. what, <laughs> what, what aspect of the character were you most excited to dive into once you got the script? I just love the idea of like basically you know after Sam disappears and goes missing you know Rachel ends up living like living just a numb 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 life you know and then with Sam appearing it's almost like she springs back to life you know she goes from being almost catatonic at the beginning and living with you know Dominic and her, her life so and she's just taking pills all the time to get through the days and then Sam appears and she just thinks that everything's going to be perfect again you know she can just get him back and and it's like Dominic is just shoved I mean there's not even a there's not even any sort of like niceness about it. she's just literally like elbowing Dominic in the face and I just really was fascinated by playing an extreme like that like what I was saying earlier about there being that lack of a sort of empathy or a kind of a kind of layer of of kindness and I just find that fascinating to explore um 
and also just explore what it'd be like for a woman who's really thought, you know, that she would never see her, you know, her husband or love again. And and then he just appears one day. So the whole, there were so many things appealed mm. to me about Rachel. Um, and she's just kind of like fantastically odd as well. You know, there's an oddness about her, as you say, there's that strange smile you know it's odd macabre she's kind of lost yeah Yeah. and very sad as well i mean the dance is oh yeah funny but it's excruciatingly painful yeah you know it's uncomfortable to watch because of just just the desperation almost yeah and I think that's what you do so well, Chino, is you can, uh, there's these like contradictions that are going hand in hand all the time, you know, that because it, you know, there's the same with you at the party, half of you is wanting to laugh so much at the way you're, you know, you're getting thrown out, you're sitting on the food and, you know, what could go wrong could go wrong. But the other half of it is so full of pathos and it's so, it taps into something really deep inside, you know, your humanity. And so I just think it, it's just such a beautifully held thing that you've done there, Chino, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, those two, because you are just like, oh, get me out of my skin, you know, sometimes it's so painful and funny and dark and, 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 nasty at times as well you know absolutely uh before we run out of time chino i wanted to ask you about the post-production process on this film uh because i i I would have thought there'd been i would have thought that it it would be quite an interesting one because you're telling three interweaving stories so there's a lot of moving parts i imagine that you had an idea of how things were going to play out in your head as you were shooting when you're done with the when you were finished with the post-production process how close was the final movie to what you had initially envisioned? Weirdly enough, probably the thing that was closest, the closest to my initial vision was that. I think was the thing that was the, yeah, all these, all the, all these kind of science fiction landscapes were very, very, very close to. I guess the difference between post production is that, that you can, it's like drawing, you can just mm. make things. To look exactly as you want, whilst when you're shooting, you're depending on on whatever the environment is or whatever the location is. Same with the characters, as I was saying about Dominic, I hated him on the page, and uh, and then I I fell for him on on the screen. But but the the post production is something that you can just keep on tweaking until it's exactly as so so it, it was very close to my my initial ideas probably the closest of, of every other aspect of the movie to to what I I yeah I I initially thought of yeah and the people who did it I think they were amazing side we have a Estonian concept artist called Elo Sode who did we, we work together in, in, in drawing this or digitally drawing these landscapes and then there's a company called Filmgate in Sweden who actually brought them to reality and made them look as if 
they mm -hmm. were in real location. So, yeah, but it was a very painful process. It was a very long, very, very long process, the post-production. Mm -hmm. Well, it was worth it. Uh, so <laughs> congratulations on the film. Uh, on that note, I'm going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much to Chino Moya, Adrian Rawlins, Kate Dickey, and Ned Dennehy for their time. Uh, Under Gods is available in select cinemas and available to stream on the VFI player now.